So first, thank you for the organizers to uh, invite me to discuss this paper. Um, I, I hadn't thought about these sorts of questions for about five years, and so it's, it's always good to come back to a topic and see what people have done with it. Uh, and I, uh, let me just start by saying that I, I really like this paper. Um, I think there's important progress here. There's some, some interesting ideas here. Um, the main findings are that there's some improved forecastability for cash flow news. Cash flow news is relevant. It's also not just relevant for dividends. I'll show you some pictures later, and, and Ricardo already showed you some too, that it's relevant for economic activity in general, so that's good. Um, there's some nice links with stock returns. Um, what I want to do in the discussion is sort of place the paper a little bit in the historical context of where it came from. And secondly, I, I have a couple of suggestions, but in particularly, I would like the authors to be more precise in the formulation uh, and, and also the language that they use, um, but also in, in, the, in the econometric specification. So what's the big context? So I think probably in asset pricing, one of the most important questions that we've all been struggling with is that you know, prices seem to move so, lot, so, so much, and, and where does all this movement actually come from? Right? And so if we just look at the price dividend ratio, and we think about the standard Gordon growth model that we start off with, with a constant R and a constant G, then that price dividend ratio is just constant, and we see that it moves a lot. So that just means that one of these two things needs to move. Either expected returns need to move. Note, I'm particularly not saying discount rates, because the, this sort of campbell Sheeler thing where we're going to forward iterate the return equation doesn't actually say anything about whether returns are compensation for risk or not. The only thing that they say is it's expected returns going forward for whatever reason, but they seem to vary, and so, or, and or uh, expected dividend growth seems to vary. And so if we want to make progress in terms of understanding what moves asset prices, we need to make progress in understanding, um, sorry, this line? Yeah. Oh, this my jail again? Yeah. Okay. I really like running the marathon, but you're not letting me do that. Okay. Okay, and so also um, different asset pricing models uh, also have very different assumptions about what this cash flow process actually looks like. And so if we can understand the cash flow process better, it may also help us write down better asset pricing models. Now, I, think, I think I've said enough in recent papers about what I think about the current state of where these asset pricing models are, but that's a separate discussion. Let's leave that out of here. Um, so now, most of the previous literature to try to estimate these sort of present value models in these dynamics essentially said, you know what, dividends are just annoying. Why are they annoying? Well, because you have these firms and they pay dividends and they don't always pay dividends on exactly the same day. And so and there are seasonalities in them and, and, and there are all kinds of other issues related with it. And therefore, you know, maybe lazily we said, why don't we just aggregate everything up to the annual level, study an annual model, and then we're done with that, right? And so this paper cleverly says, well, instead of just, you know, lazily assuming it away by studying a frequency for which it doesn't matter, let's try to just face it head on and let's try to get as much information out of these seasonalities and this announcement as we possibly can. And of course, that's a very smart idea to do. Particularly what the paper is also going to do is it's going to say, well, why would I actually look at dividend payments? Now, here's my first sort of criticism for the authors to be a little bit more, it's not really a criticism, it's just a question to be more precise. To be precise, there are three things at least that happen with dividends. One is they're announced, two is the price goes ex-dividend, and three is they're actually paid, and those are three different things. And so when we write down present value models, we actually often just use the ex-dividend moment, and therefore we assume that you get the dividends when it goes ex-dividend. But of course, when we really want to be careful about the present value and about the time value of money, we should actually take into account the difference between when it's actually paid and you get the dividend as an investor. Now, given the fact that it's pretty much a risk-free promise, and we're talking about maybe two weeks, maybe that's forgivable. But here, we're now going to look at announced dividends versus ex-dividend or payment dates. We're now talking about three months. And so if we really want to fit this in a present value model later, it may be worth thinking about that a little bit more uh, carefully. Um, as I said, you know, if you here just look at Hodrick Prescott filtered series for real GDP, real consumption, real dividends, and nominal dividends, then sort of this idea that dividends are a levered claim on consumption in many periods actually hold quite holds quite nicely. And so if you somehow can forecast in real times what, what, what dividends are going to do, say, over the next year, 
then of course we should also expect that to have some nice uh, impact for, for forecasting economic growth and consumption growth. And I think that the authors have shown that we can do that. Now, let's go back to present value models because what I want to push the authors to do is fit what they did more sort of in the present value context. So there's a bunch of confusion in the literature, I think, about um, what different approaches there are out there. So first, you can do different trading strategies and different trading strategies all have a present value representation. So the fact that we can value a firm based on total payout, we can value a stock per dividend with just the holding, holding the dividends and just get, holding the stock and getting the dividends versus doing a total firm valuation model is a present value representation for all of these things. And so ideally, we would like all of these present value models to work in some meaningful way and understand them better. So there's nothing wrong with excluding stock repurchases um, when we're studying sort of these, uh, these dividend questions. And if we can get one of them at least to work and understand them, that's progress. But that doesn't mean that once we've explained one, we should be done with the other two. The other two also need to somehow fit into, into the bigger picture. And then finally, as I already said, um, in, in many ways, unless we're willing to impose a model that tells us what the risk premium is paid for, consumption risk, long-run risk, whatever you want it to be, um, then um, we can really not say anything about whether it's a risk premium and therefore compensation for risk or just an expected return in the broadest sense of the word. You just expect to get that return for whatever reason, whether it's because the stock is mispriced or whether it's compensation for risk. So what did Campbell Shields say um, in, in their famous uh, paper? They said, well, why don't we just take log returns, take log dividend growth, then log linearize, iterate forward, you see that you don't even need an expectation operator there on that PD equation, right? It's just a mathematical equivalence that if you iterate return forward, then you get this. Now, of course, you can take expectations on both sides at the information set at time t, and then we get the usual expectational representation of the same thing. That's also fine. What does the price dividend ratio tell us? If it's high or low, it must tell us something. If it's high, that either growth is high or discount rates are low or, and, and vice versa. So we can at least earn, learn something about these future quantities. Now, of course, this representation doesn't tell us anything over, over what horizon are we talking about. Could this be over a 15-year horizon? Or could it be over the next one year? All these terms are in there, so that, that's important. Now, in the work that I did with Ralph, if you're willing to start with, say, the simplest specification for both expected growth and expected returns, then you write down an AR1 process for both, and then just you get this sort of cutesy expression down there, which is just the Gordon growth formula, but now adjusted for time varying means and time varying growth rates. All right, so we get a constant log dividend price ratio, something like 3.6. And then for every percentage point in the expected return or the growth rate, we get a change in this price dividend ratio. And so these coefficients here happen to depend a lot on the persistence of that AR1 process. We can all imagine that if this is very persistent, then the B1 is going to be big because in 1% change means that the 1% change will stay there for a long time and therefore will really change the valuation. Now, a lot of models sort of fit in this equation, right? Long-run risk says, and this is this long-run persistent component. This here is the stochastic volatility of the consumption. Habit formation says, this is not there. I'm going to assume that dividend growth is unpredictable and IID. This thing here is not quite an AO1 because you have this somewhat more complicated consumption surplus ratio, but there's time variation in the expected return there. And so you can fit these different models into this structure quite easily. Now, then what did Cochrane say? Cochrane said the following. Listen, suppose that we have to choose. And, and this is a smart point, right? Because, you know, we can have long debates, Goyal, Walt, Welch type debates about whether out of sample things work or not. But in the end, we just don't have another choice. The price dividend ratio does move. So it must say something about either of these two things. And so, what Gawkwin said was, well, if I simply try to regress things, then because the price dividend ratio doesn't really say much about the, the, the dividend growth, then it must be that it returns, right? Now, if you plug this in over here, then you see um, why these OLS regressions can potentially miss something, right? 
If G is constant and I run an OLS regression of returns on the price dividend ratio, this is then the price dividend ratio. I just get this nice coefficient and I get the nice expected return variation back through the projection. The same is true if mu is constant for G. If both move, <laughs> things get a little hard. And why did it get hard? Well, because it's an errors and variables problem. In this regression here, I don't want this piece here. I just want that piece. And then on top of everything else, not a normal errors and variables problem, it's an errors and variables problem where this thing can be correlated with that thing. So it's, not, it's completely not obvious what can happen with these regression coefficients. So what do we say in our paper? We said, well, let's just deal with that and say, here's one observation equation, two latent variables. Then add to that other observation equations. Of course, the hard thing about it is that in that observation equation, this is very noisy. AR plus noise is ARMA11. ARMA11s one, one. are a pain to estimate. So, um, well, we can still do the common filter, see what we get, and those were the results that Ricardo uh, showed you uh, earlier. Here you just have the parameter estimates. Let me skip that. I don't have enough time. So, what about other information? Well, there are tons of other variables that you can try, but the problem is that We've all started to get worried more and more, both in the cross-section and the time series, about overfitting. We've tried so many variables for so many things. Then, you know, the advantage of doing it with just dividends and prices is that we know for sure those variables need to be in there. Any other sort of variable, who knows whether they should be in there or not. So what we thought here was, well, if only we could have other yields not just the price dividend ratio, that's the yield on a long-term thing. Can we have other yields? And of course, that's where the whole dividend strip thing came from. Uh, and that, therefore, you can use other yields. You get substantially improved forecasts of dividend growth and returns, um, which is not in this paper. The, the, the sample period is sufficiently short. That, that I, I don't blame them for that. Um, Callie and Pruitt said, well, use the cross-section evaluation ratios to fix this problem. And then you can better tease out mu and g. What this paper says, and that's so nice about it, is, you know what? I'm going to get a better information source. I get more information, but I don't have to worry about data mining because I get information that certainly has to matter. What is that information? Firms announced the dividends three months before. So why wouldn't we just use that information in these equations as opposed to just using realized dividends, get that information in there? Now, here are a couple comments. First, this component here, I like this, is, they call this a slow moving mean. Don't call this t plus one, call this t. It's in the time t information set, not in the time t plus one information set. So that tripped me up a little bit. Um, and also the question now is, this, this really this overlapping nature to the whole thing, right? We're doing year on year from day to day. And so every time there is already a whole bunch of information in there from other firms that you've learned about what growth was going to be. And of course, that's what this component needs to pick up. But now you need to wonder, well, what do we call news here? Is that the news? Is that the news? Or is innovations in this the news? And, 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 and that is a little, I think the authors could do a little more work explaining to us what that is. In many ways, because we go from day to day and only a few firms announce, these things here are really sort of cleanup variables because the jump really is, you saw these huge outliers, right? In the growth series, we had these very big spikes. And if you try to do something maximum likelihood with normal distributions and you have these huge spikes in there, that screws everything up. And so therefore, this jump term is really sort of, I think, more like a cleaner variable than anything else. Though I do appreciate that the authors show that it correlates with stock information as well later on. Okay, you look here and you see the persistence. The authors say, well, it's super persistent, but uh, I'm not sure that they should call it that. I think that in the end, um, we find, found sort of a annual autocorrelation for G of between 0.4 and 0.6. Uh, now, if you look here at the daily autocorrelation, so that's also why centering it at around 0.99 in the prior is a little strange, right? Because look at the annual autocorrelation that we're covering between 0.99 and 0.999. It's essentially the entire range from zero to one, right? And so the authors actually find an estimate that's about here, which is exactly in the middle between the 0.4 and the 0.6 that, that, that we found as well. So I wouldn't call it, that's very far away from the high persistence sort of stuff that the long run risk model wants to go, right? That's up here, not down there, okay? Finally, um, uh, there's this, this interaction with um, these other factors. I'm a little worried about these differing signs. Um, and of course, there's a little bit of a mechanical thing going on where small firms just don't pay dividends. So if we're gonna look at the S minus, the S and B, what, what do dividend announcements then mean in terms of loading on them? Of course, by definition for an individual firm, as it, when you're small and you don't pay dividends, there's no news about you. OK, 
Okay. I like this paper. Um, it adds a very obvious source of information to it. It works. We get incre uh, improved pr um, uh, predictability, so I really like that. Um, there's no link made with the present value model. I would like them to take this new GT series, plug it into the present value equation, and show me that returns are also better predictable. Because anything that better predicts dividend growth combined with the present value identity means an improved estimate of expected returns as well. And so that's another thing that they, uh, that they could do. Again, thank you very much for, for having me discuss.